Anteater Nation. Welcome. I, I'm just going to start. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out tonight. How great it is to be together. It is exceptionally great to say welcome Anteater Nation here in our nation's capital. I'm executive director of your UCI Alumni Association. Uh, again, thrilled to be here and see so many friendly faces, so many new faces, but all anteaters. Uh, a very important common bond that we all share. Uh, I am a class, uh, alumnus class of 2004, and we have alumni uh, who just graduated. We have current students. We have, we have alumni of, of all class years here. So that's what you see. Uh, but let's, let's get to know everyone here in the audience. I'm going to do a quick show of hands, or show of zots. So when you go up, when you put your hand up, you're going to do a zot, okay? First, I'd like everyone who is a current undergraduate student who is studying in the UCDC program, raise your zots. Raise your zots. Yeah. Applause. And kudos to you. Uh, I, I don't know if all the alumni knew, but uh, yes, we had, we're some of our incredibly bright students here tonight. So thank you for being here. Some have even volunteered to, to, to say hi and greet everyone, so, so thank you. Fabulous alumni. Let's see Zots. Yep, Zots everywhere. Almost the whole room. I love it. Other friends, staff colleagues, community members, parents. Zots, yeah, don't be shy. Okay, very good. Now, uh, UCDC students, I hope you were paying attention because all of these alumni and friends are the ones you need to talk to tonight. Uh, this is uh, your opportunity, not only for you actually, but for all alumni in the room. That's the power of our shared connection as anteaters is to actually do that, to connect, to network. And might I say that our alumni network has become incredibly strong. 227,000 anteater alumni around the world. Impressive, right? And those are folks who you share common bonds with. So put that networking to work tonight, especially students. These are the alumni who might open the door to, uh, to an internship, to, to something, to some mentorship. And um, the uh, great thing about Washington, D.C. is we have more than 2,000 anteaters right here in the city. In the, in the metro area, 2,000. It's a very big population for outside of California. So you all are in a great space. Uh, I applaud all of you for coming out tonight. And this will not be the last time for any of you, I'm sure. So it's with great joy that we're able to reconnect here in person for the first time since 2019. It has been uh, a long haul for a lot of uh, us. We have not been able to have a big in-person alumni gathering outside of Southern California at all. This is the first one. So I hope you feel special because you, you, you are loved and we are, uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, another great part about Washington, D.C. is we have a wonderful alumni chapter here. Some of you know this. Some of you are going to learn about this chapter tonight. But we have an incredible, incredible group of volunteer leaders uh, who had this alumni chapter, and I would like to acknowledge them for their hard work and keeping things going even during the course of the pandemic. And we have big plans for what future activities are going to be. So uh, please, I'm going to uh, give a few names and then we'll applaud afterwards. President of the alumni chapter, Annie Nguyen, Annie. Vice President of the DC alumni chapter, Colby Keough, Colby. And Leadership Board Member, Mike Kabashi, Mike. Round of applause for these incredible <laughs> You'll learn more about the chapter tonight. A, a couple other uh, very esteemed individuals I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, they're not the only chapter leaders here. There's an alumni chapter in most cities where you can find a lot of anteaters. There's one here from the New York alumni chapter. President Pavan Lohia of the New York alumni chapter wanted to come down and say hi. <laughs> And we are uh, also very fortunate to have great leadership, um, anteaters in the community, anteaters uh, in government. Uh, I, I'm happy to, uh, to say that we are joined by alumnus 
and state legislator of the Virginia House of, of Delegates, Mark King. Mark, thank you for joining us. And phenomenal leadership on campus at UCI. You're going to hear from our, our leaders tonight. Another one who I'd uh, love to acknowledge, who is a champion for alumni engagement, Vice Chancellor for University Advancement and Alumni Relations, Brian Hervey. Brian, thank you for being here. Now, we have a really great event for you tonight. I hope everyone is feeling good. Our program is going to go till about uh, 720, so I hope you're comfortable, but we've got a lot of great stuff to discuss tonight. Then we're going to come back together and encourage everyone to, to do that networking over great refreshments, and we'll be here until about 8 o'clock. So let's make the most of the night, shall we? I'll encourage, uh, at that point, every alum here to meet the aforementioned chapter leadership, and we'll, we'll talk more about that because we have volunteer opportunities for you to get involved and uh, make your mark on growing the, the Washington alumni chapter. So uh, stay tuned and get ready for the, that networking. Now at this time, it is my pleasure to bring us to the start of the program. And without further ado, please welcome the sixth chancellor of UC Irvine, Dr. Howard Gillen. too busy to pay attention to these developments. Uh, so the desire for UCI education has never been stronger. 142 applications for the fall. Uh, that's number three in the United States of America. So this is yeah, no longer uh, the best kept secret, right, in Orange County. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. It, applications have increased just in the last six or seven years. Um, and UCI was, for the fourth consecutive year, the top UC choice for in-state first-generation students. So of all of the students in California who are looking for their right fit, they know that UCI is a place that will take extremely good care of them. For the second year in a row, we were number two among all of the UCs for in-state applications, both from underrepresented minority students and from low-income students. And when students get into UCI and into another UC campus, we are the third most popular campus when students have to make a choice. So we don't always win if you got into UCI and Berkeley. We don't always win if you get into UCI and UCLA. But we win against every other UC campus. And that was not true six or seven years ago, so that's all. By the way, two weeks ago, I received a letter from Secretary of State uh, Blinken informing me that UCI is in the top 1% of all universities in America for producing Fulbright scholars. So uh, it's one thing after another, and I can go on and on and on. Really remarkable. As Jeff mentioned, the last time we were here was in October 2019 to launch the Brilliant Future campaign, which is charged with raising a couple billion dollars to help your alma mater, uh, but also to meaningfully engage 75,000 of our alumni. And the alumni community has really responded to the call for uh, action and have really come together. More than 50,000 of our alumni have had a meaningful engagement over the last few years with the campus, and we can talk more about that when we get together after the event. And we're also more than halfway through our $2 billion fundraising goal, and we're putting that money to good use. So just some brief examples. Uh, in the health science district of the campus, which is near the research park, the new buildings for the Susan and Henry Samueli College of Health Sciences and the Sue and Bill Gross School of Nursing are almost complete. They're going to house the leadership and programmatic activity for the schools of medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and for the planned new school of public health, as well as the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute. Near these buildings, we plan to construct the Falling Leaves Foundation Medical Innovation Building, where faculty, medical, and graduate students and undergraduate researchers will work together to develop new ways of understanding, 
disease etiology and improving medical treatment. About a mile away off of Jamboree, in our North Campus section, uh, we are in the midst of constructing a $1.2 billion medical center, uh, including a full-service hospital, an emergency room, a center for advanced care, a second location for the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center, and a center for children's health. And near it, also off of Jamboree near campus, will be the Jack and Shanaz Langson Institute and Museum of California Art, which will display pieces from one of the largest and most important collections of <coughs> art uh, ever amassed in California. And so, yes, UCI still stands for under construction indefinitely. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, I want to make sure that if you haven't been back to campus in a couple of years, whenever you come back, it's like, oh my god, it's a completely different campus. So very exciting things. And, the campaign has also established 40 new endowed chairs, helping us recruit the finest minds in their fields, 160 scholarships, fellowships, awards, allowing uh, our top students to pursue and finish their studies, and a couple hundred million dollars in research support for our amazing faculty. And so there's more to say, wind up a chancellor, and you better be careful. Uh, but the only thing that makes me a little more pithy tonight than my usual prolixity uh, is the fact that we have two unbelievable speakers uh, and to discuss something that we're all interested in. Prepare your hard questions and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chancellor Gilman. And indeed, uh, we do have uh, two incredible speakers I am thrilled to introduce to you tonight. And uh, let's jump in. I'm going to catch my breath as I read these introductions, and you'll see why in just a moment. Bill Maurer, PhD, is Dean of the School of Social Sciences, fellow social sciences alumni, another is up. Oh, a lot, there we go. And professor of anthropology, criminology, law, and society, and law at UC Irvine. He's one of the world's leading experts on the monies, artifacts, and techno technological systems, from cowrie shells to credit cards. He directs the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion at the Feline Center of Excellence for Financial Technology. A Feline Fellow, he is currently conducting research on AI and consumer financial services, social relationships between human, technology, human and artificial agents, data cooperatives and data governance, and blockchain technology and law. He is a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and served on the board of Behavioral, Cognitive, and Sensory Science at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. He has worked with numerous government and industry partners from the Federal Reserve to Intel and has contributed to fields as diverse as numismatics, and human-centered design. He's a board member of Orange County United Way, in which capacity he's assisting in the planning of a guaranteed income pilot, and is currently working on a joint project with a number of colleagues in social sciences and informatics at UCI, and the credit union system nationally to address access to financial services for vulnerable populations and economic equity more broadly. The fact that Dean Maurer had any time in his life to join us here for DC is a small miracle, or more accurately, a testament to his leadership and championing alumni engagement. Now, allow me to introduce our second speaker, and then we'll have applause and introduce them to the stage. Dr. Andrew Huang is a periodontist living in Irvine, California. He graduated from UCI with, for his uh, Bachelor of Science in Biology went to UCLA for his doctorate in dental surgery before completing his master's in periodontology at Columbia University. He comes from a family of dentists, as both of his parents, sister, and brother-in-law are also dentists. Dr. Andrew has always been interested in technology after completing dental school. He co-founded a couple startup companies that assist doctors with their patient reminders, online scheduling, and website creation. While on his journey of being an entrepreneur, he, became a, or he came across blockchain and immediately became fascinated with it. Dr. Andrew spends five to six hours every day, including weekends, 
researching the topic and has retired from periodontics to focus solely on the coming blockchain revolution. He currently lectures for Link2, a blockchain-focused pre-IPO marketplace, along with private tutoring for interested parties. He has dedicated his life to learning and educating others about blockchain, and tonight we're the, we're the benefactors of that. Allow me uh, to uh, welcome uh, Dean Maurer and Dr. Wang to the stage. that the conversation tonight speaks to a much larger portfolio of work at UC Irvine, spanning law, information and computer science, and social sciences on the impact of new financial technologies on society. Tonight, we'll hear about cryptocurrencies. At Irvine, Dean Maurer and his colleagues from across the campus are currently working on a joint project with the credit union system nationally to address access to financial services, for vulnerable populations and economic equity more broadly, among many other exciting projects. If you'd like to learn more, I am sure Dean Maurer would be delighted to talk to you uh, uh, during the Q&A, which we'll have after this program and later tonight. And now, without further ado, one more round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's great to see some familiar faces and to meet some new folks. Um, uh, thanks to you for the lovely introduction. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go back and forth a little bit um, up here. We're going to start by talking about our own crypto journeys. They're a little different. Um, then I'm going to say a few words about, at a very high level, about what's been going on just in the first quarter of 2022. Because if you follow this space, there's been a lot of action. Um, We'll switch gears a little bit then. Um, I'll say some words about money, like what is money anyway, to set the stage for what is crypto anyway, where Andrew will take over for a bit. Um, and then we're going to get into uh, you know, some of the responses to what's going on on the part of governments around the world and say a few words about the outlook for regulation as well as for monetary competition and um, monetary government governance more broadly. So that's basically the, the outline. Um, we sort of rehearsed this a few times, but you know, uh, we've never actually done this dog and pony show together before. So bear with us, and thank you again. Um, so Andrew, besides being a dentist, um, got really interested into crypto. So tell us a little bit about your your crypto journey. Yeah, um, after I finished my long, you know, studies in to become a dentist, which was. Um, yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> I uh, started a couple companies, and from there, um, as with any company, you need funding in order to become successful and grow. And during that journey, I was invited to a family office meeting where you have very wealthy individuals who essentially have their own private hedge funds working for them. And up until 2017, uh, this meeting was in, I believe, the summer of 2017, I kept thinking that crypto, blockchain was just magic internet money. And I really just brushed it aside, and I really didn't really believe in it, right? But when I went to that meeting, there was an executive from Coinbase there. And that really sparked my interest, because I was thinking, well, if these very wealthy people are now starting to get into blockchain, maybe I need to start learning about blockchain myself and kind of figure out what the fuss is all about. So um, I did come back home, and I started reading about Bitcoin specifically. And I read the, uh, a paper about how Bitcoin works about 50 times, because it took me that many times before I really started understanding just the basics of how blockchain and crypto works. And all of a sudden, it just clicked in me that this might be the future of money. And there are so many applications of that, of that besides just money. Um, so immediately, now this is November of 2017, I invested $30,000 into crypto. And within a few months, I was able to turn that $30,000 into $5,000. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, that, of course, kind of sucked. But um, the, it was a blessing in disguise for me because what happened was it allowed me the opportunity to dollar cost average in for the next three years of the bear market, which I can tell you how excruciating that was. <laughs> and then uh, finally, with the recent um, you know, bull market, I was able to retire from periodontics and uh, sell my practice. So I'm just full-time investing now as a crypto investor. But you're still cleaning teeth once a week. Yeah, I, yeah, I still yeah, work yeah. as a dental hygienist still, once a week. He still has that hedge there. Yeah, just yeah, just case, because, just because I, yeah. 
I didn't want to waste my education for, for so long, right? <laughs> Originally, I was, I was thinking about teaching at UCLA, but it was just too long of a drive, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I'd rather be doing this. Great, yeah. thank you. Well, so um, my crypto journey is a little different. Um, I didn't have $30,000 to, to lose. Uh, but in 2009, shortly after the Satoshi white paper came out, which many of you know is the white paper that said, Bitcoin, a new electronic money, here's how it will work. Um, I was sitting in a cafe with two of my then grad students, now PhDs, happily employed, working on stuff. And I get an email from a colleague of mine who I had worked with in Kenya on mobile phone-based money transfer systems um, in that country. And some of you may be familiar with these sorts of things. Um, she was working at the State Department. She emails me the Satoshi white paper and says, what on earth is this? Is this like some sort of bad joke? Tell me what this is. So you know, I look at it with my grad students, we scratch our heads. I forward it to a colleague who was then at the Atlanta Fed. Um, the Atlanta Federal Reserve has the Retail Payments Risk Center, um, which like you all should subscribe to their blog. It's really great. Um, <laughs> um, they're always on the lookout for new things in money and all the delightful ways we can be defrauded, all the risks they can pose, technological hacking or otherwise. I email it to her. She says, I have no idea what this is. She emails it to an undergrad RA that she has that term working for her. Within 24 hours, this young woman emails all of us back her analysis of the Satoshi white paper. She explains in very clear language what blockchain is, which we'll try to do ourselves in a little bit. She explains what, how she thinks crypto is going to work, how it will probably unfold. And she concluded with the sentence, this is never going to raise, it, never going to rise to the threshold of the Fed's area of regulatory concern. Right? It's never going to get big. Never going to get big. This is ridiculous. So here we are. <laughs> here we are where, during the pandemic, um, in part because of this uh, bull market, in part probably because of the pandemic, and people at home, bored, doing things, the whole GameStop kind of explosion, blah, 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 cryptocurrency market capitalization topped $1 trillion for the first time and it has remained above that level ever since. And that's where we are right now. It is definitely at the Fed's threshold of regulatory concern. And um, we've, we've seen just in the first quarter of this year, a ton of things happen. So let me just kind of try to run down them real fast. January 20th, Eric Adams, new mayor of New York, says, I'm gonna get paid in crypto. Okay? He ends up not actually getting paid in crypto because federal labor, labor law says you have to be paid in dollars. So he gets his dollars and converts it into Bitcoin, whatever. Also, um, that same week in January, the Federal Reserve releases a very long-awaited report on, um, on cryptocurrencies and the possibility of a central bank-issued digital money as fill-in-the-blank question mark, as a route to financial inclusion, maybe through something like um, accounts at the Fed for everyone at the post office, um, as a way to counter or counterbalance the, rising, the rise in crypto to provide another kind of digital asset for people to invest in and have, it, have the safety and soundness of the Fed, or for international monetary competition, because China had already issued a digital version of its currency. So the Fed report comes out around the same week that Adam says, pay me in Bitcoin. Um, just a couple days later, a team working at MIT with the Boston Fed drops the code base for Project Hamilton which is basically, uh, you can go play with it. It's an open source um, code base for playing around with different design specifications for something that might end up looking like a central bank issued digital money. Um, that happened then. Uh, and then what happened? February 4th, I believe, the Winter Olympics in China. Why are the Olympics relevant? Does anybody know? What did China do? Biggest marketing push ever for its E yuan. Um, all the athletes got little watches that had some free money preloaded. People who went to the games had the Chinese state-issued digital money um, directly tied into central bank accounts on little cards that were made to look like red envelopes, like digital hongbao, right, for gifting and all of that. Um, and it was like, you know, the Olympics, and it was going to be a big thing. It was actually a complete flop because nobody wanted to use it. Nobody trusted it. The foreign athletes were like, um, this is how they're going to monitor us and spy on us and, 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 or, and or steal all of our data, right? Um, Chinese were like, this is how they're going to monitor us and steal all of our data. And besides, I've got WeChat Pay, WeChat Pay and Alipay, which work just great, right? Existing private issued 
um, digital payment services that work fine. Um, and in many ways, the sort of China story of why they issued the Yuan in the first place was to um, counter and challenge the rising power of those, those platforms. What happens next? Russia invades Ukraine. What happens the very next day? Bill Maurer gets called by a reporter um, who says, do you think that the Russians are all going to go into crypto because of coming sanctions? So I don't know, right? So I go to a website called Fiat Leak, where you can see in real time conversions of fiat currencies into different cryptocurrencies. You can do it right now on your phone. And I mean, I'm going to just be hyperbolic. Everybody in Russia was, was buying Tether, right? <laughs> which is like a super interesting choice, right? So there was a lot of people converting rubles into a cryptocurrency called Tether which is a so-called stable coin whose value is supposedly tied to the US dollar. It is still, but it's unclear how that actually happens. It is supposedly backed by commercial paper, including most likely commercial real estate paper in China. I mean, so it's just all, like just let's throw in all the risky things and then also have it be owned by a number of shell companies and questionable jurisdictions. But regardless, the Russians were buying Tether. So I reported this to my reporter friend. And almost immediately, um, the UK, Ukraine government said, we need help, right? Send us money in Bitcoin. We will accept um, donations in crypto. Um, thereby opening a channel around the very kludgy, clunky international payment system to get direct aid from individuals um, around the world. And it, and it happened, and it seems to um, have worked. March 1st, the state of Colorado said, we will start accepting taxes in cryptocurrency. Except, not really, except um, <laughs> if you pay your tax in crypto, they immediately have to convert it um, using an unnamed, unspecified third-party platform into dollars, um, just again because of law. So I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then sort of the, the, the March um, 7th, I think it was 7th or 8th or 9th, I have the date, uh, Andrew has it, the Biden administration finally issues its long-awaited executive order saying, hey, we need a whole of government approach right now ASAP um, on what we're gonna do about both digital assets like cryptocurrencies and, um, and other associated kinds of digital assets, which we can talk about later, and also whether we need to get into the game of having our central bank issue a digital denomination, issue a central bank digital currency the way that China has. So holy government approach. They called on all the agencies to submit reports within, I don't know, 60 days or some ridiculous time frame. Um, the very next day, department, is there anybody from the Department of Labor here? Department of Labor was ready. The very next day, boom, they're like, please don't put these in your pension funds. <laughs> um, this does not comply with ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Investment Something Something Act, right? This is like way too volatile and we don't want these things in our pension funds. Thank you very much, you know, Department of Labor out, right? Mic drop. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, a number of senators headed by Elizabeth Warren um, at the end of March um, put forward a Senate bill that's still being discussed um, asking not, not, not to shut down potential Russian evasion of sanctions using crypto, but to require uh, foreign registered um, crypto exchanges to monitor and, and produce reports. Okay. That's a ton of activity um, at the federal, state, and every kind of level international level in a very short period of time. Crypto kept going up and up and up, some fluctuations hit above two trillion for a time, now I think it's back down to like 1.8 um, trillion um, total market capitalization. So what is this? Is this a sea change? Is this an inflection point? Is this the beginning of a whole new era of fill in the blank with digital money? Like, I would point to a couple things first. Um, the fact that at the end of the day, the mayor of New York got his money in US dollars and had to convert it, and that Colorado had to convert any crypto in, back into US dollars, tells us something. The dollar still matters and is gonna matter for a really, really, really long time unless we screw it up, which Andrew will talk about in a little while. And a very important point for how we even think about cryptocurrencies and money in general, we still live in a world where political authority, the state, sets the standard. The standard of value, which is what money is, the unit of account, is set by political authority, the state. Right? The state says you gotta pay your taxes in dollars, you gotta get paid in dollars, the end. Um, and you know, in, in many ways, that's the, the way it's always been. Um, 
crypto seeks to challenge this, right? Crypto seeks to create a world where we no longer have one authority setting the standard of value, but a community of peers or a network of nodes um, in a system that is designed so that they can create a new standard of value without one central authority saying what that is and issuing it from on high. How they do that, we'll get into in a second. Um, but, but the, the um, important thing that that raises is it really forces us to ask the question, what is money anyway, and where does it really come from? So, pop quiz. Where's the money? It's in the bank, right? But it's not, because what's in the bank? <laughs> It, think, think about the old, old Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life, right? When there's the run in the bank and all the people come in and, and they're like, you know, I need, I, mean, I need to get my money out now. And, and Jimmy Stewart explains, you know, no, you don't get it. Your money's not here. Your money's in her house and his farm. You, don't you see? Right, remember that line? Don't you see? You put your deposits here and I've lent them out to build up the community. So we just got to stick together. Otherwise, old man Potter is going to come and buy this town out. Right? Thank you, Elizabeth, for knowing the movie very much. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, um, and, and it's sort of an important lesson, right? The money's not in the bank. The bank makes the money. How does the bank make the money? It's a bookkeeping operation. It makes the money on its books through a ledger operation by issuing loans to people, right? I issue a loan, um, all of a sudden, hey presto, there's, there's a hundred dollar loan, hundred new dollars in the world that I, a bank, invented. The Fed didn't invent it, I invented it. The Fed, the state, has chartered me to operating according to certain rules, so I have certain reserves and certain kind of, um, you know, I have capital adequacy in the event of a run. The state in this country also gives me an out just in case, which is deposit insurance, which is a very nice thing to have if I'm a bank and I'm making lots and lots of risky loans and a very nice thing for us to have um, as consumers who might bank with banks who make bad decisions. Um, but it's a bookkeeping operation. And um, you know, I have to play anthropologist at this point. Um, it's always been a bookkeeping operation. We, we have this lore that money emerged in the dim mists of time when primitive people um, had direct barter and like if I had fish but I really needed pottery, I'd bring you my fish and you'd give me your pots. Um, that actually rarely, if ever, happened. Um, instead, what you had was very generalized systems um, of reciprocity where people marked and memorialized their relationships with one another with politically authorized memory devices. And if I could ask Vice Chancellor Hervey, please, to reach into my bag and pull out the big shiny thing. I'd, I'd hop down and get it myself, but earlier the Chancellor said break a leg, and that's exactly how I would do it. <laughs> but like, like this, this is a, 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 called a Kina shell, a Kina shell valuable from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. This is an early 20th century um, object in the collection of the institute that I direct. And um, these would be given to um, a woman at the time of marriage uh, for what purpose? Essentially, to symbolize all of the exchanges of goods that are happening between families um, when this, this couple is coming together to form a new family and to mark the debt. So that in the future, if I'm from you know, the groom's family and I need some help with something, that thing reminds me, oh yeah, those people connected to that woman owe me stuff. Right? It's a memory device. Early anthropologists saw things like this and said, oh, that must be their primitive money and imagine that they were actually exchanging the shells, but they weren't exchanging the shells. The shells were just made visible at certain times when we had to remember that debt, when we had to remember that, that relationship. Thousands of years earlier, a whole other part of the world, you have similar, um, similar systems of memory keeping. This is a replica. Don't worry, I did not steal this from the Smithsonian <laughs> earlier today when we were there. Um, <laughs> In the ancient Near East, um, you had similar records of, of debt and credit recorded on clay, right? On cuneiform tablets like this. Um, and this ba these are basically kind of almost like futures contracts, right? Where, where this, this one in particular is all about getting certain, um, a certain amount of beer and grain in the future in exchange for labor that a bunch of people are giving right now. Right? There's no token exchanged. It's all bookkeeping. In that case, with my shell, 
It's the kind of headman of the village who's the political authority who says, we're going to use those shells people to mark those relationships, right? It's still coming from, from the political authority. In this case, it's, it's, your, it's your scribes and the heads of your sort of political religious organization that's saying, we're going to keep track this way. Um, there, was, there was silver and gold and all of that circulating, um, but more as tribute, right? This is the real thing. That's the fake thing. That's the on the side thing. Um, later on, folks ruling these sorts of city-states and empires would start issuing small ingots, small tokens in precious metal, but mainly as a way of extending their political authority. Right? You belong to my state, have one of these. And by the way, in seven years, you're going to have to give me seven back. Right? So to direct that flow of tribute, to get those taxes back in and consolidate my authority. Um, now, what's interesting about this, besides that it's fun as an anthropologist to whip a cuneiform tablet out of your pocket for <laughs> me, is the early Bitcoin people sort of got that, right? Now, the problem is we're so distracted in the cryptocurrency world by all the words, all of the metaphors. None of them work, right? We use the word coin. We use the word token. Um, we talk about wallets and addresses. Um, but that's not actually, like, existentially what it all is. Fundamentally, it's a bookkeeping operation. Fundamentally, it's a set of distributed digital ledgers through which a network of peers validates transactions to the network um, whenever someone posts it or requests it. You don't own a Bitcoin. What you own is essentially, like, rights to an assignable space on a digital ledger, um, which then can be signed over to someone else. Think of it as, I don't know if anybody, you, you got to help me, Howard. This used to be a thing. Who's, who's, I mean, who's old enough here to remember? Remember the, remember, well, I mean, I need, I have all these like students in front of me. I only see them. Do you remember how you used to be able, you get a check made out to you, and you'd sign it over to someone else, and then they'd sign it over to someone else, and then, then they'd sign it over to someone else, thank you. It's more like that than it is like, here's my Bitcoin, Jeff, catch, right? It's more like that sort of signing over, over rights. Um, they, they understood that. They understood that it was a bookkeeping thing. They understood that through a decentralized bookkeeping system, they could create a, potentially a new source of value separate from the centralized ledgers authorized by the state and managed by banks. Um, but I think that one of the reasons why um, crypto remains so hard to get um, and why people make really stupid decisions about it sometimes is because of all those metaphors of coin and whatever. And even the way that it gets visualized is always, you know, Bitcoin is always like a gold coin with a B on it. <laughs> no, that's not what it is. So that's my, my little bringing us up to how distributed ledgers work. And I think Andrew's going to say a bit more on that, that topic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to start by first talking about how our current system works, right? Let's say I want to send Bill $100. Well, there's a bank in the middle that works as an intermediary between us. It is the only entity that has the ledger that, from the bookkeeping that you're talking about, that has the ledger system that's, that can authorize that, hey, I have the $100 that I want to send to Bill. So therefore, only the bank can verify and validate the transaction. But when we're talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, what, what the Bitcoin network does is anyone in the world can go online and download a copy of the Bitcoin network. And when, or I'm sorry, the Bitcoin ledger. And by doing so, now you can have peer-to-peer -peer validation and verification of all the transactions within the network without needing a central authority, right? So now I can send $100 to Bill through Bitcoin, and it's just validated through the community. And the community competes to see who validates the transaction first, and whoever validates it first gets a little bit of Bitcoin in return, right? So Bitcoin and blockchain essentially also decentralizes the power away from a central authority and gives it back to the peers. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so in effect, <clears throat> what happens is um, I, in, in a crypto world, I say I'm going to sign over you know, a Bitcoin to Andrew, and I post that to the network. And what, what every, it's now it's not really everyone in the network, but like a lot of people in the network, they're not even people, they're computers. They're not even computers, they're giant server farms. <laughs> what they all start to do is imagine that check again with all, this, all the signatures on it. They all start to be like, okay, 
we have this space in the ledger, and the last signature was Bill. Who was before Bill? So and so. Who was before that person? That, all the way back to, to verify that no one along the way copied, right, or created sort of another instance of that space in the ledger or stuck another name in there, um, right? Which, because the whole, the whole problem in a digital environment with anything of value is cut and paste, right? Like I can copy and paste and now I have two. Um, and that's sort of what the Bitcoin system is trying to, the initial system in Bitcoin is trying to do, a, get, a, get away from. So it posts this to the, to the network. The members of the network all try to validate. And then there's a game of who gets there first. And just to make it harder, there is an incredibly uh, energy uh, consumptive, computationally intensive, environmentally destructive um, game of chance thrown in um, just to make it a little harder and then to incentivize people to play to play um, more. So we can come back to the, the technical details later if, if people want. But you know, one of the key things that Andrew said here is that this is a part of a, of a decentralizing um, kind of movement in, in the way that te the technology works to assign um, rights to value. And you know, when you think about it, um, we have been in a, in a historical period um, you know, at least since you know, 2008, if not before, of a lot of decentralization um, in a bunch of our institutions, right? This is, here it is, we're talking about money, but think about social media um, and what, ha what has happened to journalism, right? Think about the, the rise of libertarian and anarchist movements, right? Think about distrust in government. Think about all of these efforts to kind of disintermediate um, the conventional middlemen, so to speak, um, and whatever, market direct to the people, or you know, have a peer-to-peer, -peer, there's all kinds of peer-to-peer -peer things, I can't think of, like Etsy or something, right? Um, even though Etsy, of course, is the platform that is the middle person in this case. Um, so it's, it's a piece with all of that. It's part of really a broader political phenomenon um, toward uh, an interest in disintermediation and decentralization. So, as I said though, you know, the state still sets the standard, right? Um, Eric Adams still had to get paid in dollars, and you still, uh, Colorado still gets its money in dollars too. Um, what have states been doing? Well, what states have been doing, um, really, and we'll talk about the U.S. in a second. Maybe I'll, maybe, I should, maybe I should say what other states have been doing is um, saying, "Oh, we need to pay attention to this, and we need to think about what this means for our own money supply, for monetary policy, and how we ourselves make money, how we issue um, currency." So it, the Bank of England, um, uh, the, the, very, the Bundesbank in Germany, the various sort of uh, central banks that make up, the, that are involved in the countries of the EU, China, even countries like Nigeria, even countries like Palau, um, have all been experimenting with a version of a central bank issued digital currency. Now, um, what is it or what could it be? It really, really, really depends. Some are playing around with blockchain type systems. Here's why. What they want to do is have some kind of um, low denomination digital currency that people can use for everyday transactions so that they can phase out cash for all kinds of reasons. Cash is expensive to produce, it's bulky, it's big, it, it itself has an environmental cost. I am very much a pro cash person because cash is also accessible to everyone, it is democratic, and Crucially, it settles at par. Cash is our only payment instrument that settles at its face value. For everything else, someone has a fee somewhere, right? Um, and the Federal Reserve did that. And um, I can tell you more because it's one of my favorite stories. When the Fed did that, they actually had to go around to banks around the country packing heat um, to tell bankers you can't, you, you can't charge interchange um, anymore on checks, which is what they were doing. Um, anyhow. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not an anti-cash person, but, but they're thinking, you know, this is a way that we could provide financial access, especially to the poor and unbanked. We could then phase out cash. We could then do things like this and think about how this feels to you. We could do things like, in time of crisis, we could just helicopter drop electronic, electronic money into people's smart cards that they have tied into the system, right? So if you need to get COVID release, relief out to people, it's just there, um, coming directly from the central bank. Uh, that's, maybe that would be better than what happened in our last batch of COVID relief where un and underbanked people got debit cards um, but live in a cash world and so had to go to the ATM and get out the cash to then go pay their rent. But um, 
The other thing, of course, that you can do if you're a central bank and all money is digital um, is you can drive interest rates below zero, right? Because right now you can't. Because what do people do if interest rates start going below zero? They go take it out as cash and put it in the mattress, right? Cash is the limiting factor. Um, cash defines the zero lower bound for interest. Um, if you get rid of cash and have a central bank digital currency, gone. Um, to, to their credit, a lot of folks in um, central banks around the world look at both of those things and a kind of recoil, right? They're like, we don't, we don't want that much power. <laughs> we are not supposed to have that much power. And even in, um, in the Fed's uh, paper that it put out in January, they actually said, look, don't even come talking to us about that kind of thing. Because if you want us to do that, we can't. You would need to change the laws. Congress, you go work on it and fight it out. That's not our job. So that's, that's good. Nevertheless, you have around the world states experimenting with these things, some on blockchain. So you can have things like cash that would circulate anonymously at low value. Um, others not like that, like China's system, where the central bank um, basically issues its own digital currency to banks who then issue it to you in the form of whatever, a smart card or something or an app. Um, there, you know, what China is worried about, in my opinion, is not crypto. They're worried about WeChat Pay and Alipay, right? Sitting on vast troves of consumer information and data that they don't, I mean, that they don't have access to, right? That they want access to. And if everybody was using the e yuan on some app from some other bank, then the state would have it. Um, but, but all this raises a set of, of other issues, too, that have to do um, with regulation, both of the crypto space um, and governance of crypto and um, central bank issued alternatives. And I think Andrew's going to conclude on that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think the United States right now is in a very interesting but also precarious position. Precarious in that the <clears throat> US dollar is clearly the global reserve currency of the world. And it will remain that way for, uh, I think, quite a while, right? However, what Bill was alluding to is all the countries in the world right now are trying to chip at the U.S.'s dominance for the U.S. being the global reserve currency. That's why China is one of the uh, forebearers and one of the uh, pioneers when it comes to creating a central bank digital currency because they want to uh, implement that with their Belt and Road Initiative and try to build a system outside of SWIFT, which is what the U.S. currently um, you know, controls. Um, same with like Russia. Right, uh, Russia is very pro cryptocurrency uh, ever since the Ukraine war because of the sanctions. Right, they need another way, another outlet to bring money into their country. Um, but in the end, even with these uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, I'm sorry, with with these adoptions of cryptocurrencies, the state level fiat currency is still the most um, end goal or powerful thing that every country controls, right? So like on um, April 1st, Putin uh, said that, hey, we're still going to sell you guys oil, but you guys must buy it in the ruble, right? And that was very important because that literally brought the ruble back from the, uh, from, you know, it's dropped from 50% since the Ukraine war back to where it was uh, pre-war. So um, the United States needs to get on board with this. And I think another like uh, metaphor is they need to be a little bit more Apple, be a little more like Apple, where they are able to cannibalize their own uh, devices like the iPod, right? That was obviously one of their best selling devices and not be worried about going to the next itineration of like the iPhone. The US needs to adopt central bank digital currencies and have clear regulatory guidelines so the United States can maintain the, the leader um, to be uh, maintained as the leader and uh, foster innovation in this country, so the wealth of um, cryptocurrencies stays also within the, uh, the country. I mean, it's really a question of sort of whoever builds the infrastructure wins the platform war, kind right. of, right? And right. right now, China is building the infrastructure for digital currency, and other countries are like, okay, that's fine, we'll just, we'll just innovate on top of that. Um, which then, what happens to the dollar? So. Uh, I think we leave you with that hopeful <laughs> note, sorry, and <laughs> we'll entertain questions of all kinds. Hi, uh, I just uh, Matt Lappin, uh, alumni from, I forget what year now, 96, I think. Uh, touching on the foreign policy piece, because this is DC, so I have to ask the question. 
um, given that there is this obvious interest of the U.S. government for like statecraft, whether it's foreign policy or you know international economics, to maintain the supremacy of the dollar, but also given, as you say, the platform wars, we might be a little bit behind. Where are you seeing right now, other than say the Elizabeth Warren letter talking about uh, regulating, you know, sanctions monitoring, I guess, or sanctions evasion? What are you seeing right now coming out on that front? Is there stasis? Is there movement? Nothing. Is something happening? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. we've been sort of talking about this for the past couple of days. Nothing. Um, the usual. The uh, you know, um, one would think that everything happening with Russia would scramble politics a little bit better than it seems to be around some of these questions. Um, it does very, uh, it's just so interesting to see what's happened just in the past few months. Like all of a sudden everybody knows what SWIFT is, right? And nobody knew what it was before. And everyone's like, oh, there's this thing, really? <laughs> and you know, it's this communications network that you can just shut off banks from? We did not know that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Should, who should control? Who has that power? Blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, as long as, things like that work in the interests of the United States, I think that politicians are content to just let things go. Um, but uh, you know, I think it was great that the Biden folks said, we really need a whole of government approach right now to this problem. Every single agency, get on it, work on this, figure out what we need to know. Um, where will it go? Really hard to say. I mean, you know, the, I think that there will certainly be some stuff, some more action by the CFPB and the SEC. Um, by the CFPB because of the obvious consumer finance protection issues that are involved with a lot of the, the garbage that's out there. Um, with, the, <laughs> with the SEC, because sometimes these things look a lot like securities, right? I mean, if I say, buy my token and you've got a stake in my startup that doesn't exist, that's a security. I mean, that's, <laughs> right? That's the old, the old what, what, is, what was the guy's name? The Orange Grove guy? The Howie test? Yeah, Howie test. Right, the Howie <clears throat> test. Anyway, a guy with oranges in Florida. You could buy some, but they didn't exist. Um, which led to uh, some of the, the sort of the, the beginnings of SEC regulation around securities. But do, we, do you think that there's going to be any action? <laughs> uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, but I do think it'll, it'll take time. One of the main barriers is simply that we don't have enough education and knowledge about the blockchain space. And um, that's why I really hope to, to motivate our politicians to understand that this really is a national security threat mm -hmm. if we don't align our interest with crypto and foster the innovation that is existing in this country. And um, yeah, I really do hope that we can, we can um, Kind of like in the net internet years in the 1990s, we had great regulatory clarity and um, great regulations. So then the internet industry really thrived in this country. But we're not seeing that right now with crypto in this country. And it's still, I mean, I would just add like at the state level, because of our system, the way that it is, the, the expert is there on federal systems. Um, it's so wild westy right now. So you have some um, state governors and legislatures rushing to be like, you know, we're the crypto beachhead, come here. Uh, you need laws, just give them to us and we'll pass them. <laughs> That's probably not the way to go, right? I mean, that really is just sort of folks wanting to look like they're the tech innovation beach hub, attract talent or whatever to their state, maybe, but also just have a bunch of get rich quick schemes that are gonna hurt a lot of people, I think. I have a question. Where are you? Oh, there. I'm here. Hi, Chandra Middleton. I graduated uh, last year. Um, anyway, so my question is another very DC question uh, about regulation. So thinking about um, not just the financial aspects, but also the environmental aspects. And is if it's a whole of government approach, what, what about DOE, EPA, yep. FERC, mm -hmm. all those folks? Do you want to say a few words about what the EU is doing? Or? Yeah. Um, then we we'll come back to the states. You start yeah. in Europe, and I'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Specifically regarding the environment, um, proof of work, which is what Bitcoin is, and Ethereum currently is, but it's migrating to something called proof of stake. Proof of work is where we're talking about a lot of the energy usage and waste of energy, right? So it's gotten to the point where even the EU has been trying to propose laws to ban proof of work. Um, there, within the crypto community, there are people called Bitcoin maximalists, and they be believe that Bitcoin is like the, um, 
is like, uh, like a religious thing, right? Like they think Bitcoin is gonna solve the whole world's problems. I am not one of them. Um, and they think that the energy usage of Bitcoin is actually a feature and not a flaw. Uh, so it'll be very difficult to see whether they're, we're able to convince the Bitcoin people to change to a different consensus mechanism in order to alleviate the energy concerns. Um, but as of right now, it doesn't seem like Bitcoin will go towards that route, which is obviously a concern when you're using as much electricity as multiple small countries combined. Let, let me just cl clarify for those who don't know, proof of work um, is a thing that actually comes from the early days of email. Um, and what proof of work is, is that business where I said, you're, you're rushing to be the first person to, to, to verify the transaction, but you're also playing the stupid game on the side, this game of chance that gobbles up all the energy. Um, that, that originated in email. The early problem of email was, was, I mean, we have spam now. In the early days of email, it was like spam galore. So um, uh, protocols were introduced into the email protocols that we all now use, so that any time someone sent an email, um, it would also, the, 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 the client, the email client, would also have to run a little nothing program, right? Just a little nothing program to gobble up computational cycles, right? Which gobbles up more electricity. Now, if you're you and me sending, you know, 100 to 1,000 emails a day, no biggie. But if you're a gigantic spammer trying to send out millions, all of a sudden your costs have gone up, right? And it, it's exactly that mechanism that was, that, that was built into Bitcoin um, for reasons. But um, the, the EU thing is interesting. If it, if it works, um, it'll be a fundamental change. But there will still probably be these Bitcoin maximalists who will say, we don't care. We're just going to split the, the blockchain, split the ledger, go our own way on our own fork, which is how they talk about this, um, and keep doing it in the bad way. So it's not a good, pretty picture. The only other thing I would add is that um, neither is our world of increasingly online, all the time, um, connected devices using crazy AI. There's a wonderful book that came out um, sometime during the pandemic by Kate Crawford um, that's called The Atlas of AI, which is all about the energy consumption involved in those sorts of systems, and it's staggering and increasing all the time. So all of which is to say, it's really, really bad. There's a whole lot of bad, Chandra. I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's going to take um, a lot of, of attention to make it less bad. There needs to be something, there needs to be more of something like a lead system for these sorts of things. You're welcome. <laughs> Set your mind at ease. There's one more question. I think uh, there's one. Oh, uh, oh there's, sorry, there's one. Hi there, Dan Cozen, yeah. uh, graduated in 2012. Uh, I guess building on that question here, with getting rid of the proof of work, I guess one of my concerns about Bitcoin is the ability to actually do the transaction speed. So I think for the Bitcoin, it's like, what, seven a second? It's seven bad. transactions per yeah. second, yeah. It's bad. So if you think about how many transactions occur in the United States, every second, it's what, 150, 200, 300, you know, that, without getting rid of proof of work, would that actually allow it to accelerate to get closer to that? Like how much so? I'm not really sure technically how, how close. So, so the issue is, if, if you don't know right now, um, so Bitcoin basically fails as like a transactional device, right? If you want to like buy something, it's going to take forever. It's going to take you 10 to 15 minutes, right, for that to happen. Um, the Visa, Visa network does 65,000 65, transactions a second. Um, when uh, I teach, I have taught this class um, on the future of money, and I actually have uh, had them do a little lab where I buy a little bit of Bitcoin and then I give pieces of it to group leaders in the class. And then all that they have to do is send it to each other and then track it in the blockchain since they know each other's addresses, they share them, um, and then write about it. First year worked like a charm. Second year, um, everybody was late. And, and, like I sort of, and then I get started getting like the excuses that you get if you're a professor, sorry, current students. Um, and I'm like, oh, come on. And this student is like, this student isn't any good. And then he comes to class anyway and whatever. But then I started getting the same thing from all the smart ones, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like true confessions of a faculty member who are like, Professor Maurer, I've been trying and trying and trying, but I just can't, it's not there. I just can't see it. I can't find it. I don't know what to do. I tried this. And, I, and what it was was there had just been, um, this is when you could trade in, in crypto in China. There had just been a crash in the Shanghai stock market and tons of Chinese were buying crypto. So the whole thing slowed down to even worse than 10 minutes. It was like 
four or five hours, right? And all my panicky students are like, ah. Um, it's not a transactional system, right? Um, that's why right now it basically functions as a weird, freaky, speculative asset class. Um, it's still not a payments method, like at all. So there's potential, I, actually, I think, for non-blockchain based, you know, like proof of stake or alternative systems, like some of the things that the Fed here is exploring um, for hopefully anonymous-ish transactions with super fast transaction speeds, lots of transactions per second, but it's probably going to be um, rolled out at low value for two reasons. For a technological reason, which is easier, but then also for um, uh, compliance with know your customer anti-money laundering stuff, right? Um, if you keep it below a, a certain amount that I can do every single day, then the risk of me using it for money laundering or terrorist financing goes down. And we already have, we already have an anonymous non-KYC payment method in this country. It's called the $100 bill. So set the limit at $100 a day, done. Um, which also might solve some of the energy problems too. That's what Bill would do. Bill would also have postal banking, which the Fed already said no to. But um, I don't know if you have a, want to say anything about the transaction time. Um, yeah. That's why Bitcoin now will really just be, like they changed the narrative of Bitcoin. The white paper and the first sentence of Bitcoin literally said a peer-to-peer -peer transactional like blockchain. But that's never going to happen with what you brought up with the transactions per second. Um, so that's why the narrative has now changed to be a digital store of gold, which is the Bitcoin narrative that I do somewhat agree with, right? Uh, you do see certain countries like uh, building on that nar narrative, like maybe El Salvador and uh, potentially Panama, Uruguay. Uruguay are all talking about um, adopting something similar. Uh, but as a currency, it will probably not be there, even with the advent of the Lightning Network, right? Which is something that uh, Bitcoiners are trying to talk about because the Lightning Network just mimics the current existing financial system and the same flaws of it, like pre-funding, Nostro Vostro accounts. You have to keep um, the channels open or closed in order the, for the transactions to go through. Uh, so Bitcoin as a currency right now doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Okay. Are, you, are you shutting us down? OK. <laughs> Shut we, it down. Decoding crypto could probably, you know, we'd be in here all night, and then we still would all be confused, right? Uh, We'll continue the conversation. How about that? Great. In the reception. Uh, round of applause for Pedro and Thank you so much uh, for the program. And I, uh, I'm going to say just a few words before we move on to the next phase of the program. But yes, lots of uh, great thought. Hopefully, we can all continue the conversation and, and have more questions afterwards. Um, and now I am at the point where it's me and the bar behind me and the, the new food stations. So I'll try to keep it quick, but we do have a call to action that's very important. So back to uh, what I was discussing earlier. We have now the, the chance, now that we're in person, we're together, we're meeting to strengthen your alumni network here in, in Washington, DC. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, to talk with Annie, Colby, and Mike, chapter leaders get involved. We have uh, new sign-up sheets at the, uh, at the front table. I encourage you to sign up. We have some alumni spirit packs for some lucky individuals who, who do get involved with the chapter. But we have gifts for everyone here. So be sure to stop by the, uh, the reception table before you leave. But we're not leaving yet. We are, we're in here and we've got food and we've got drinks, so enjoy yourselves. I want to also introduce a few other important colleagues who are here. Other phenomenal resources uh, who, who you may want to talk to. There were a lot of social sciences majors here. Dean, uh, Dean Maurer, obviously, head of the school. But we're joined by great colleagues, Tracy R. Curie and Liz Cotaspati. Wave your hands. Thank you for being here. They would love to, uh, to talk to you. And another great colleague from UCI, Alberto Sandoval. Alberto in the back. He is uh, our director of federal relations, senior directors. Thank you for joining, Alberto. There are other ways you can engage as well. You can be a mentor to students or alumni on the Anteater Network, easy to join, literature up there. You can also uh, host an internship, you or your employer, for our phenomenal UCDC students who are here with internships, and we need those. That's a great way to pay it forward 
and give back to our community. Join our Anteaters in DC Facebook group, LinkedIn group and page coming. Uh, links will send you in a follow-up email. Uh, get your gifts. And uh, once again, I would just want to give a special thank you to Chancellor Gilman, to Dean Maurer, and to Dr. Huang. Everyone, one more round of applause for our wonderful speakers. It's not the last time. We're going to zot. I'm going to go one, two, three. We're going to go zot, zot, zot. And then everyone's going to get up and meet each other. One, two, three. Zot, zot, zot. Thank you, everyone.